We love horror movies from the 70s and 80s And we watch them for two days straight And then we go write a book Now we're looking back at every title One at a time in this podcast that we put out monthly Once we've had an episode for every movie It's time to meet up for another shock marathon all right, uh, the red record light is red, and we're here for uh, a shocking and exciting episode of the Shock Marathons podcast. We're here, as always, with Charlie Roxburgh. Hey. And Tom Scalzo. Hello. But today we have um, uh, movie director Dave Payne with us. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hey, hi. Thanks for having me. All the way from L.A., Dave Payne, who's got a, uh, a great resume, including uh, the Reeker movies. Uh, what, what, else, um, what else is on your resume, Dave? Uh, if we go way back to the 90s, um, I started working for Roger Corman. So I have a whole bunch of movies on my IMDb page that I barely remember. Um, nice. Yeah, I mean, do do you guys remember Showgirl Murders? <laughs> we How do. about yeah? <laughs> I've seen it. I was just telling someone I met some Corman people the other night, and, and I was recalling and remembering that two of my movies were on Entertainment Weekly's worst named movies of the year in like two thousand. Nice. Or no, it was like nineteen ninety six or something. That, that was Alien great. Alien Terminator, <laughs> and, uh, and and the aforementioned Showgirl Murders. None of which were the names when we shot them. Not, not that the names when we shot them were much better. Oh, but. <laughs> well, Dave. Farley just came up with the, uh, a name for a next movie we might make. Do you, do you want to tell it, Farley? Well, Tom, it's really Tom who came okay. up with it. Tom. Well, then Tom can tell. This, would have, this might have made the list. <laughs> Non-negotiable diner inheritance. Oh, nice. That's, 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 <laughs> Farley put yeah. the diner in there. Never have, those, <laughs> never have those words been together. But there's, no. It, 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 tells it, it tells it like it is because... <laughs> Someone, being Farley, will inherit a diner, but he doesn't quite want to. The diner is cursed, and the deal can't be negotiated. (laughs) It writes itself from that point forward. And then would you be opposed if the distributor changed the name to sell it to Lifetime? Uh, No, uh, we'd be fine with it because that's what happens. You know, we (laughs) all our favorite movies um, had... um, what they wanted to be and then what they ended, ended up being. And that's a beautiful um, transformation. And it's so cool that, uh, that you've seen that happen and, and that Entertainment Weekly noted it. That's awesome. Yeah, the first movie I made was called, that I wrote that I really thought was going to be my breakthrough movie was called Scorcher when I wrote it. Then it became High Desert Run when we shot it. And then when it was released, it became Criminal Hearts. And I thought it was going to be my Reservoir Dogs. And I cry- and actually tears came out of my eyes when I heard the name. And then when I saw the box art, tears didn't just come out of my eyes. Like they shot out. Like, like I was so upset. There was a purple heartbeat signal like on the oh. box with like the two heroes kind of looking at each other in love. And I thought I made this dark, noirish kind of desert crime movie. And yeah. it was just instantly ruined. Now, did you grow up um, as a big horror fan? Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, uh, the Super 8 films I made were horror-y. <laughs> they always had blood. Um, but no, I enjoyed all movies, but certainly, you know, Exorcist was the scariest movie I ever saw. And I enjoyed Poltergeist. But no, I was never like just a horror nut. But horror is um, the way to go, especially when the budget is low, I, I find. Do you agree? Yeah, I think when we made the Reeker movies, it was the first time that I went out and find, found the financing. And there definitely was a, a, a part of us that were, where we were thinking, well, let's make a movie that we know we can make cheaply and have a good chance of making our money back. Right. Cause so during, it wasn't just a completely artistic decision. Like during the VHS boom, that was, that was the main way to get something out. Because when like Charles Band was coming out with the stuff, he could – you know, the day that the movie came out, he could sell it to all the video stores and like make his money back like the first week, right? I think that's pretty pretty much how it would work. And now, nowadays, I don't even know. Like, I wonder why Roger Corman didn't make horror movies. I mean, he was just sort of known for it in like the fifties or something. And every once in a while, he'd do something that could be considered scary. But in the early nineties and the late eighties, it was just you know thrillers and kung fu movies. And I wonder yeah. if they just—I wonder if horror didn't have the same international appeal. And Roger knew something. Like there were like three territories that wouldn't buy the blood and guts. 
You know, but Charlie yeah. Band was making them so cheap that he didn't even need that extra hundred thousand yeah. dollars from Turkey or wherever it wasn't selling. Right. They got up to Ghoulies Four. I think. <laughs> I, think I think Ghoulies Four is more, uh, more, you know, go- rated R than the first one. But I was just reading about that. Someone had to talk him into the the Ghoulies with the toilet and the Ghoulie coming out of the toilet box cover. Which right. lived in in infamy. That that is what part of what made him like a fortune. That that image of the little gremlin type ghoulie, just yeah. head popping out of a toilet, and it says he'll get you in the end. Um, that was that was gold. I remember that. Yeah. So how sad now for you guys that all the movies now they just don't have the nice boxes or the nice box art. You kind of get the know. one piece you see on iTunes or whatever. Especially for That's Tom, it. he's he's the, he's a he's the truest uh, collector and fan. Yeah, it's 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 just sad. That's what I, it, the experience of actually, you know, going in a store. And I remember at my local store had had the horror room, and there was a skeleton in a rocking chair out front, and oh, it was yes. all like done up as like you know like a haunted house, and all the box covers were turned out to face you, you know, and you could like go mm. and try and sneak in there when you were a little kid, and and it was it was magical. Yeah, we're not gonna have any nostalgia anymore. We're not, and no one's gonna um, anticipate watching a movie for years and years because you would just see it on the shelves. Charlie has just declared the death of nostalgia. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's true. You can put it as you can, it's pretty you can much have, true. <laughs> make a screensaver for your phone or iPad or something. <laughs> yeah. Now, so you're um, like Reeker, for instance. Um, what was the release for the first one? What kind of release did it get? So we made it with nothing in place. So the idea was we kind of had a vague idea of how the business worked. I mean, I'd made movies for other people before, but never for myself. Never ever knew how the back end worked and how you made your money back. Um, I mean, you we read about it and you sort of had this, you know, kind of like gossip about how it worked, but no one would ever give you numbers. So we made it with some sort of distribution ideas in mind where we felt we could recoup. And at the end of the day, we ended up taking it, getting it a few festivals, some bigger festivals that really helped kind of up the profile of the movie. So people kind of came to us and then ended up, we ended up, geez, it was like a six month process of selling it, but like working angles and screening it at festivals and trying to um, sort of control the, um, the perception of it as best as we could, sort of online and to buyers. Um, the second a Variety review came out that, that really, that was very positive, we, the value of the movie went up a couple hundred thousand dollars. The offers just jumped up from that one review. Wow. Um, so it's interesting. So at the end of the day, we weren't necessarily, because we just wanted to learn about the business and make a little money, it wasn't about getting it in theaters necessarily. It was about sort of getting the best deals and just learning about the business that way. So we ended up selling it to Showtime and sort of Paramount Home Entertainment in this country. And in the rest of the world, we sold it to a bunch of different distributors. We had a foreign sales agent, um, and he just each territory kind of did something different with it. In a bunch of territories, it had wide theatrical releases, like in uh, France and the U.K., um, tons of screens. Um, in the U.S., it just went straight to video. Uh, that, uh, so now, is it out of your hands? Like, um, in terms, could it be airing on television right now that you don't not even aware of, or what? Um, yes. So, so Showtime or Viacom or Paramount or whatever entity has it, they have the right to do whatever they want with it for seventeen years. That was our deal. Cool. So, in like seven years or something, we get it back, and then we could resell it. So you hope it's sort of in good hands. You're basically renting out our apartment. And, they ho- and you hope when you get it back, it's not trashed. <laughs> so, so, so far, the tenants basically haven't been paying rent, <laughs> but we can't kick them out for seven more years. And that's <laughs> kind of standard from what we understand. You, know, you ask for accounting and stuff, and suddenly your tenants don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> What what contract? What accounting? Yeah, we. Um, so yes, it plays all the time on TV. It's on all the time, and we see nothing. Wow. Yeah, we get a report for River Beast um, every quarter, uh, without explaining why we haven't earned any money yet, and then we just kind of we just kind of <laughs> laugh at it. So it's it's similar for you, I guess, huh? Yeah, you do your best to control it, and, I, and to a certain extent, everyone understands that whatever money they give you in advance is basically all you're going to make off of it. Oh. I mean, unless it's the next Insidious or whatever. But I think by the time we sold it, we knew that there was not a mechanism in place to make it 
the next big thing. Nor do we think it was the next big thing or ever could be it, but it just, it, it sort of ran its course and we just, you know, did the best we could with it. Well, it's, it's out there. It's in the conversation. That's pretty awesome. Charlie. On, uh, on those reports, Dave, they have a line for miscellaneous charges against the movie. And it, I think they put in $750 on the nose is the miscellaneous charge. <laughs> Always. It always, yeah. <laughs> like, Maybe there's a good like restaurant right around the corner that everything's exactly ten dollars, including tip, and they take the yeah. office out. Yeah, no pennies. Like, throw us a bone and do like five hundred and twelve dollars miscellaneous. It's just, it's just an insult to. Well, I guess in theory you could. I mean, they always say you can, you can hire accountants and 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 and, and have it audited. I mean, that's a very expensive thing. So you have to really believe there's money there. Yeah. But it does scare them. You know, the right legal letter apparently scares them. You know, we hear stories all the time. And the right, like some lawyer, a lawyer I know can just mention the name of a certain accounting firm. Like, and then there's some tr- key lawyerly word that you can say, like, about the books and this accounting firm. And they'll immediately start sending you honest statements. Ah, you know? that's cool. We just don't think there's much in it, you know, anymore. So it's not worth, like, trying to go down that path. Yeah. 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 We didn't even get it. We got zero up front on top of that. So, <laughs> so no, we, uh, <laughs> we paid to 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 buy the to buy the hard drive and then put the master on there and then that's, send it to them. That's funny. And did you have to get E and O insurance? No, they covered that, which is nice. That was good. Yeah. yeah, that was nice. And I'm sure they marked that up fifty percent. Now what do now for the sequel, um how did how did that work? Uh we I, I thought there were some unresolved issues that I needed to like get out there about the story. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then we also just had this, we had a nice sort of uh, system in place to get, let's say, a Reeker movie or a horror film out there. And uh, so the, a lot of the buyers that bought it around the world had success with it and they wanted another one. So I guess, you know, it sounds kind of terrible, but it was sort of a safe bet to make. So at the time... Uh, I think we wanted to start making a lot of these types of movies. Um, and it was just going to be another one of many. Maybe I'd direct one or two a year and we'd hire other people. We started going down that path of setting up a business. But right around that time, 2006, piracy became really bad. It was like a weird, super unsweet spot before video streaming kind of became a big thing or you're able to monetize sort of, you know, Netflix wasn't buying as much. They were just doing DVD releases from sort of studios. Uh, iTunes wasn't streaming movies yet. So piracy was a huge thing. And we took a big hit on that movie. The market just changed from the first Reeker a year and a half earlier to the second one. Mm -hmm. Um, Territories just disappeared. Spain, which used to buy a movie, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. They they had zero dollars. Like that, that was the year Blockbuster left Spain. Spain, more people were pirating movies and watching them at home than seeing them in theaters. Russia disappeared. Russia bought the movie from us, paid us in advance. And when it came time to actually deliver the elements to them and, and for their second payment, they said, no thanks, keep the money. It's already out here, pirated. We can't make a dime off of it. Wow. So a bunch of territories we just saw vanish. So, uh, so, so things, suddenly our idea of, of... Things are a little better now than they were even then, I guess. I think so. You know, we haven't made a movie since then. But from what I understand, there, there are now pockets. You, you, have to, you still have to make the movies cheaper. I mean, we shot both those on film. And um, there, there are still low budget movies, but they were, you know, it was real money. I think now you have to go, you have to go mumblecore mm, or kind yeah. of not at all. Yeah. I but think when, someone like, sorry. Oh, they, but then don't, don't they have to be packaged together, Dave? Like you can't just make a small one and then unless it gets really, really good festival stuff, you can't just approach Netflix or anybody and get any money. It, it, it has to be somebody who has it as a package. When you see like, you know, when you were scrolling through and there's like the funny B horror movies that are streaming now, none of those people deal directly with Netflix. No, unfortunately, they're still, from what I understand, you have to, it has to be packaged, whether by yourself with yeah. your own content or a distributor. They just don't pick up the phone for the guy who has right. the one movie, and then, which is a shame because right. you want to you want to cut that 30% out you're giving that, that distributor who's basically... They'll just want to give like two hundred fifty dollars or, or or something for the rights for like streaming for like years or five hundred dollars or something. Really, yeah. I think, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's it's tricky. So there's still the business still has some evening out to do. You know, things got a little cheaper to make movies, as you know, with all the digital stuff. Uh, but mm-hmm. that's only shaved a few hundred thousand dollars off. Let's say, oh, we don't have to shoot film, we don't have to develop film, we don't have to rent the Panavision camera. We could shoot on a DSLR. So there's there's two or three hundred thousand there there. You know, <laughs> yeah. Of, of a sort of, are, a quote. 
bigger movie. Are you itching to uh, do it again? Or do you have anything um, in the works? Yeah, there's another horror film. Yeah. <laughs> We'll probably shoot it next year. We're just exploring different options for getting it made. We can we can make it on our own. Um, we could, you know, we have some interest from a few different companies that do this sort of thing. But we're we're trying to just figure it out. I think it's just scary, like that. It it has to be made even cheaper than we made Reeker for and the sequel to sort of yeah. make sense um, for for the market. You know, to just to, to to just have a chance of getting out there. Well, do you want to tell Dave about the cold calls? Farley? Oh yeah, we have a good plan um, to make our <laughs> our money. <laughs> the new we finished shooting the the la- the new movie on Sunday, Dave. Oh great, the, the cops movie, yeah, Slingshot Cops. And what we're gonna do? I don't know if I have the um the the fortitude to do this, but we talked about just dialing random phone numbers, like a telemarketer, and just encouraging people to stream the movie on Amazon. <laughs> Hello, sir. My name is Matt Farley. Just finished a new movie called Slingshot Cops, and a would really make my day if you if you rented it on Amazon.com for a mere four ninety nine. How how about that? <laughs> wow. By the way, I bet if you got into the swing of it, it wouldn't be so hard. You know, the first twenty rejections. Look at like, look yeah. at people saying yes. It's genuine too. It's not. Yeah, uh, and it doesn't not, sound illegal. It's not like you're trying to raise money to make a movie with cold calls because that's right. illegal. Right. It, it is. Here, yes. Interesting. Uh, and here's my other idea. I just came up with this today. <laughs> Door to door, right? Door to door with with a briefcase that you could pop open as a tablet in there. Sir, would you like to watch the trailer to a new supernatural buddy cop film at the doorstep? Uh, Why, yes, I would. Maybe you play it there, and then you could have the little sleeves of DVDs right under there. Because I mean, in, in if you could sell a few DVDs, if they're like five dollars and it's at the doorstep, and the person who's in the movie is on your doorstep. Oh my god. Well, interesting. Or if you target your audience or you go to Something. a college campus and you have Square and you can give out codes, like you actually set up, you know, have it on Vimeo and you give out the password. Five bucks, I'll give you the Vimeo password. Yeah. And you swipe their credit card and I think you'd get a lot of sales actually. Yeah, we would have to target it like you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we're you gotta be relentless and uh and shameless. Um which I'm pretty well, I'm, which I am. <laughs> because it's one thing to get your movie on at any of these streaming services. It's another to get it to bubble to the top. So there's still a certain amount of marketing or <clears throat> leverage that your distributor has to use to get it to be one of the featured you know, movies that weekend that's right. released on iTunes. So, and Tom, yeah, wait, Tom, we- Tom, do you remember who we were researching as well, who, uh, who I kept talking to you about, who made his Arkansas money by traveling around? Uh, Charles B. Pierce? Yes. yes. So we were researching Charles B. Pierce and in order to yeah. cut the middleman out. Do you remember his routine? Uh, I can't remember. He, he would pretty much he pretty much just took the movie into a van and drove around personally to the to the drive-ins and Oh, right, right, right. Did that kind of thing. And he he like bought a theater and showed it until until people started coming to watch it, right? And it became a thing. I think so. The Le- Legend of Boggy Creek. He's pretty cool. He's worth researching his his exploits. Yeah, because he That's he thought creatively. Crazy. Yeah. Dave, I have so, a question. Um, would everyone crack up after you would do the shots of people covering their noses? I can imagine that must have been fun on the set. <laughs> like, I know. It was, yeah, it was. That was tricky. I thought it would be funny to try to see if I could pull off having. S- such an uncinematic sense <laughs> explored in a film <laughs> as smell and still make it scary. And it, and it, it worked for some it people. Totally it totally worked. A, I love it. But I, yeah. if I were one of the actors, I, I'd just be waiting for that moment. Like, when am I going to be able to, uh, to cover my nose? You know, because that's, uh, that's like the, the money shot. The, uh, when, when I was working for Roger Corman, it was always very, very important that you played it straight. Like, you, know, you knew you were working on crap. And it was just like you just couldn't – as much as you wanted to kind of make fun with it and have fun with it, that just wasn't allowed. That just meant that you were just eliminating like, some sales. It just wasn't. You know, it might impress your college friends or whatever, but it wasn't going to impress the market. And I think with Reeker, it was kind of that, that was the approach also. Okay, we're going to play it as straight as we can, even though it's kind of subversive and silly. Yeah, but that's what we like. Uh, we, w- yeah. when, when people are winking at the camera, um, that's no fun, but when they're when they're giving it their all, then then you love it, right, Tom? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the the, the 
the only you know moment in the room when it feels off is when that guy is making his underwear joke because he's he's the only one that wasn't taking it seriously. Although, yeah. although you did have a joke uh, in the second reeker that was real subtle and, and fun, where um, in the hospital uh, they're try- near the end. You see in the hospital, and one nurse says he didn't make it, and the other one I think says you owe me twenty dollars. Or was that the line? Maybe I don't remember. Okay, <laughs> I just watched it this afternoon, but it, I, I gotta I, watch it again. It was a genuine laugh, and it was it was real, just real quick. There, well done. Yeah, it's funny. That movie, those both those movies did well, sort of on the sort of festival circuit with crowds, with the right you know, the right kind of horror fan. I think when it was kind of left on its own devices, you know, on cable late night and stuff, it wasn't as well received. I think I think people didn't quite know how to approach it. Maybe without seeing the box art and the tagline, it just was maybe taken a little too seriously. It's funnier with people in the room. I like that. That's how oh, yeah. you should watch a movie. Some hear some chuckles, and it's yeah. much more fun in a room. We I also gonna, felt we had. Oh, go on. Oh, no, you go, you go. You're the guest. We felt we had to market it straight. We had to market it straight. So everything about the box was kind of like, you know, there was a wafty smell, but it wasn't, we couldn't position it as a, as a horror comedy. That, that wasn't the right. Yeah, that's, that was smart. Um, I was going to say, I feel like with, um, with music, you know, how everybody wants to buy, uh, buy vinyl now and stuff, and I feel like you sell one album and it pays for, what would you say, Farley? Like, how, how many streams would that equate to if you sold one vinyl for, like, $25? Like, crazy amount of streams, Yeah, I'll right? do the math. Hang on. <laughs> Keep talking. I'll tell you in a second. But, um, like, with our new movie, if we made a big box VHS of it and it had nice cover art and it could sell for, like, you could probably sell a big box VHS for, like, 25 dollars i'd say as a retro piece of memorabilia thing that would be a nice thing to do but i don't know if it's easy to get display like replicators anymore or the box yeah that actually the factory to make that is somewhere in america right it's a great idea like how many everyone still has their vhs machines might be in the garage or in the closet or in the den yeah, for the weirdos who like our movies, yeah. like I think that that would be like, wow, look at that the artwork! It's calling out to me. It's like it's you gotta own it. And uh, yeah, did, you, been, did you have any merchandise, Dave? No, we didn't. We didn't do that. I mean, for the festivals to kind of market it and get people in the door, we had you know wristbands and T-shirts. Uh, by the way, it's five thousand streams, so you'd have to have five thousand songs uh, streamed to equal the money that you'd earn selling one vinyl at twenty-five bucks. So that's now. Is there a chance, oh. though, with um, technology getting yeah. better? It, currently, like an independent musician can get his music on all the major platforms and make money off it. Whereas, you can't just get on to Netflix um, and all those others. But when, in in part because the amount of data involved in a movie uh, just eats up so much that they don't want a bunch of junk up there. But Will it get to a point, Dave? Do you think where um, anyone can just get on Netflix? You know, the way that anyone can get on Spotify. I, I don't know if Netflix is set up that way. It, it feels like I've heard people talk, some producer friends of mine, that Netflix is, is trying to sort of curate, you know, sort of present what they believe is sort of quality work. So, so it's, I've, from what I understand, they don't just take anything <laughs> right um, yeah even it's, though i'm sure they have the server space but I, someone's got i guess youtube is that right now and uh and you it's you can't really make money off youtube um unless you make like a, a, a minute long cat video but uh i don't know maybe in 10 years there'll be some sort of platform where you can get in everyone's house and if and you get a you know you get a few uh, you get a, a quarter if every time someone watches your movie and then um that would really uh, open things up, I think, if if it could happen. Yeah, but how, the trick is, how do you get that person to 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 to, to find your movie? give you the quarter or to find your movie? Because in theory, you can set up a website tomorrow that has your movie on it and put a, a cash register or a store on the back end. Yeah. Well, well, the cold, idea would be if you sp- cold calls, Jeff. cold calls. <laughs> <laughs> the simple, idea would be simple. that you you pay ten dollars, you pay ten dollars, <laughs> or it's part of your cable bill or something, and then the money, just like with Spotify, the money is then distributed to the the rights holders. And the way people would find it is that um, you come up with titles that are very similar to popular titles. That's that would be, <laughs> that would be right. my trick, at least. <laughs> Yeah, whole asylums do, doing that. And then the mon- the monetizing on YouTube is interesting because you, 
I've heard you don't make as much off, let's say, the ads per se that are running. But if you have enough subscribers and enough people watching your videos or video or whatever, um, you would make the money as sort of branded content. So you would, you would have to find some sponsors, you know, some local yeah. car dealership or something. And, um, and that's where these people really make the money. Although on YouTube, you're buried with a long form. You know, long you got to keep it. Long form is terrible. So, yeah. You got to have a million short videos. I, we have our one long Freaky Farley up on YouTube, and it, it has made me, what, counting in the ads I've run, like neg, I'm negative $92 right now. <laughs> on <laughs> uh, Freaky Farley on YouTube. But what's awesome, though, <laughs> is that you know that YouTube exists as an app on Apple TV. So in my room with my big TV, and I turn on Apple TV, there's YouTube, and I'm typing in the words Freaky Farley away from watching it nice in HD on my TV in my living yeah, room. Yeah, that's but true. But how, you, how, you, yeah, how do you intercept that and make a little money off of it? Yeah, I yeah. guess the way you got to do it is... Um... I don't know, actually. <laughs> we haven't heard the last word on what Apple's going to do because the iTunes never was good for movies. I mean, we had mm. one movie up there, but someone had to download over a two gigabyte file to watch it. And pe who's going to want that big of a file on their iPhone or iPad to, to live there and to wait like half an hour or whatever for it to download? There's, they, they have something coming. I just don't know what it well, is. Right now we have fast internet at home, and it's. You, I think you're basically streaming it. You're not downloading it. Oh. But I could go and buy a movie and instantly watch it in HD on the big screen, and it works well. But it, to oh, download okay. it, you're right. It will take an hour or so. It's super sluggish. To, to own it locally, yeah. it'll take some time. But there's no yeah. reason. To, all the movies just exist in the cloud, and as long as you have fast enough internet, you're just streaming it. So you don't have to take up your hard drive space anymore. Yeah, ours was uh, – when, when, when it came out, people had to – I guess this was a couple of years ago. So for Manch Vegas, people were owning it locally and they had to download for all that time and then take up so much space on your phone or your device. I have an idea. How about when you're taking the show on the road and you're going door to door, um, or you take the show on the road going door to door, you do right. shows at night. So I don't know if this is working, but that um, the guy who directed Saw 3, the, um, um, Daryl Bowsman, Bowsman, yeah. He does that. He's, I think his last two movies, these sort of musical horror extravaganzas, he's taken the show on the road, like with a few sort of dancers and you know circus freak type ah. people, in, in, like an indie rock band in a van, mm. and they get people to come out and sort of do a, I guess they do a live show and then show the movie. Um, mm. But geez, he is, not, as far as I understand it, he's not going door to door or making cold calls while he's in those towns. Yeah, he, he <laughs> made it into an event. That's what you got to do. Make it into a night out. Yeah. yeah. Our other idea was was to possibly kill somebody off that's in the cast and start a big uh, big backstory about that. Yeah, if someone what? dies, yeah, if someone <laughs> dies during the making of the movie, then the movie is considered cursed, like like Poltergeist, right? Uh, you know, everyone who was in Poltergeist died, and that's great um, advertising. Well, if you make a movie a year, you guys, and you <laughs> maybe cast three or four people out of the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Who probably, as a dying wish, might want to be in a movie, right? Because I'm sure they're out there. <laughs> Want, they wanted terminally people. ill, yeah, terminally ill <laughs> actors wanted. Yeah. But terminally ill actors who have a certain <laughs> social media rating, like on, on Social Blade, you must rank X, Y, Z. A 90-year-old with like a good Instagram following. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the beauty of it is, these are the same uh, underhanded, dirty tricks that um, were considered and sometimes actually done by the uh, filmmakers that we respect from the from the seventies and eighties VHS times. And uh, you know, it's different problems, but um, you know, different specifics. But it's the same general problem, which is, you know, how's the little guy uh, get it out there? So, uh, um, it's pretty awesome uh, that you're what you're doing uh, on your own. So there will be another movie in the next uh, few years? There will. I think, uh, yeah, I can't give it up, <laughs> as um, you guys know. <laughs> yeah, so you, now you went, out, you went out into the desert for the other two. Um, where's the – I don't want you to give away too much, but where this, would this This one's much place? more contained. It's all in a house. It's one of those house movies. Uh -huh. but, but it's a slasher movie. There hasn't been a good slasher movie in a while or sort of a take on that. That genre. Um, we're, we're in the sort of era of, uh, I call it the Black Blood era, the PG 13, you know, s spirit movies where there's no, you can't show blood because it won't make a PG 13. So that whenever there's liquid coming out of something, it's black. Huh. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> and uh, that's, I mean, that's done very well. All the, the Insidious movies and The Conjuring and Paranormal Activity, they're, they're great. I but, like ones uh, with, a, with a house or, you know, some kind of suburbs in there. So it doesn't feel so, right off the get-go, isolated. if it feels so um, unfun. Or mm-hmm. it, it's like it's already in like a poisoned radioactive asylum. It's like right, from yeah. the get go, like you can't get any worse than that. It's yeah. already a poisoned asylum with a flickering fluorescent bulb and garbage on the floor, and the characters are already crying. It's like I want a little bit of fun yeah. in the and, beginning, and yeah. it's scarier. It's scarier if it's relatable too. So you know, if it's in in a common uh, home, then then that could happen to you, the viewer. You know what I mean? Which makes it yeah. scarier. Right? When a when a stranger calls uh, back, the beginning of that is awesome. You know. You go straight to when a stranger calls back. I like that. Right. <laughs> Not even when a stranger calls. I, I, yeah, I think I prefer the beginning to when a stranger calls back. Although, when a stranger calls, once Charles Durning comes in, it really picks up steam. <laughs> That's a lie, right? Yeah, that okay. is a lie. I was like... <laughs> but, oh, did you... Uh, we got to tour um, Tom's... We were visiting Tom recently, Dave, and we saw his VHS collection... Um, which is awesome, and uh, it's like a lesson in marketing and uh, just VHS era history. Tom has it's, it's glorious. So how many? many? Oh, how many times? Even, uh, I don't even. I don't even know. Maybe. He's got a secret room. You have to go through a closet to go to the secret dormer uh, room, and it's nothing but horror. It's it's just a nice, beautiful little area. Right. It's like your VHS humidor. Do you know it about is, yeah. um do you know about it's dormers, wonderful. Dave? No, I don't. Do they say that in Chicago? No. <laughs> they didn't say it for Farley and I didn't know it either, but there's like a little secret room that's up against the outside of your house next to a bedroom is called a dormer. If it jets out outside of the yeah. sort of like outside of the roof, uh, if there's like right. an addition that yeah. goes that jets out from the roof, that's a dormer. That's your vocabulary word for the, this lesson. Yeah, I guess in the context of an old-timey house, I know what it meant. But for some reason, I thought you were bringing up a VHS horror film from the 80s called Dorm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh man. Something at a college campus that takes where there's a ghost in a small room off a house. <laughs> that is such a good idea. Yeah, that's good. Sort of people under the stairs like, but the people in the dormer, or the, the, the co-ed in the dormer. The, the dormer in the dormer. Tom, oh, yeah. <laughs> Tom, how do you organize your tapes? Is it just alphabetical, or is it by year? It's it's by distributor. Is that true? Oh, yeah. true. <laughs> is that true? It's absolutely course, true. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. true. So it's easier to maybe look at the spine and see the little logo of the company and then drop it in, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And you know, a lot of our favorites are uh like Regal, they have these really nice big big box that don't really fit in my shelf, so I had to put them on a table and it's nice to have them all together. I What's don't. the ratio of big box to like regular VHS box, cardboard box, sleeve? Uh, probably, I probably only have about thirty or forty of the nice big box box. Maybe like four or five hundred the the old timey small boxes. The, the the and the big boxes don't withstand the test of time. The few I have, I seem like they're curling at the top a little bit and they yeah, have lost shape. They're delicate. They've, they've gone through a lot of hands. It's it's you know it's when I was living in Boston, there was a great store. That uh, they had everything, and the owner, the owner, I went in and just talked to him, and he had he had every horror movie you could ever imagine, and he had them all on display, and uh, he had he had hand cut these little uh, styrofoam inserts to put inside all the covers, so that they wouldn't lose their shape, and he would keep the covers in the store, so he'd rent you out the uh, the tape, but he wouldn't let you take the covers. Yeah. Uh, he was, That's how he my was store great. was. Yeah. You had a store too? But no, I mean, not my store, but the, the one I grew up going to. The, st- oh, the styrofoam okay. stayed in the sleeve, and then they put yeah. your tape in a little plastic thing. Yeah. That's the key. And then tell me this. How are you going to deal with, or have you been dealing with, the decay of the tape itself? Yeah, it's a sad, it's a sad thing. I've been trying to, uh, to copy them to make a, make a disc, you know, digital uh, version right. of, of them all before I lose it. Um, cause there's something about it, even if you have like a nice new Blu-ray that you can buy, having the, the actual VHS experience it, you know, it kind of takes a few seconds to, to get the uh, tracking set up. And then you hear those great notes of like active video or Vestron or whatever it is that, 
you know, it starts. Right. To, it starts. <laughs> it, 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 you can't match it. <laughs> That's true. Like I digitized most of my music. You know, I had a bunch of vinyl, and then I bought, you know, replaced everything with CDs. Then when it came time to digitizing the music before all these streaming services were set up, I digitized all the CDs. But yeah. it would have been better to go back to the vinyl to have the scratches and the yeah. needle drops. And I never, oh, I didn't yeah. think that. I just thought pristine. I didn't think character. Yeah, I've been slowly trying to work through them, but it takes a long time. Well, we won't keep you forever. This is uh, really cool. Maybe we'll just do last lightning <laughs> round of uh, questions. I, I can start. Um, what was the bug situation uh, filming Reeker out there? Is it very buggy? Was it like the night scenes or what? I didn't was, see any bugs on screen. It was bugless. The first movie we shot in the winter, so it was super, super cold. So we had a problem fighting the actors, um, the, the cold, whatever, that smoky breath, the cold breath mm. thing. And then the sequel was The Dead of Summer, so it was super hot and sweaty. But no bugs? No bugs. Oh, not the at desert, all. yeah. The desert is oh, good for bugs. Nothing dry. And, and how long were you out there for, for the second movie and out in the summer? Both, I think, we spent maybe 15 days in the desert, and then both had like a couple days in town in L.A. Cool. And uh, I saw Charlie's legs, by the way. He did a great job. as the, His uh... torso is awesome. <laughs> Whenever I'm talking to my kids about Charlie and, and I have to remind them who Charlie is, I, I say he's the one in, you know, Reeker that, you know, is the legs of Reeker. It's like, oh, yeah, I love Charlie. Well done, Charlie. <laughs> Thank you. All right, any, anything else, Tom or Charlie? Uh, no, it's just been great to, great to talk about movies with someone who's, who's been living it for the official going through the trenches, and that's amazing. Yeah, there are trenches. Cool. That is true. <laughs> yeah. Well, since we just finished our other um, other project, and we were so much like in desperation of thinking, like, how are we going to distribute this? We were we've just been brainstorming. So that's where the cold calls came mm -hmm. from, and the uh, the door to door. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's been having finished that project and then going on to the next thing of trying to get it out there has been funny. Oh, and we're we're also doing a lot of teasers, I think, for this one, Dave. A lot of trailers. That's a like, good idea. Yeah, like many, many versions. trailers, all different right. versions. We did. We shot like four or five uh, in in like very quick, very quick, like Farley in character, one take. They were WWF to... style. It was, you know, like um, oh, yeah, to the camera. <laughs> to the yeah. ca exactly, just like how like uh, hacksaw Jim Duggan would be like shouting at the camera, like I want to bring you down. I was doing that, and uh, I had a blast. <laughs> I don't know. Charlie, I did too. I did too. It was it was going pretty well. So I, I do my part. I wear my Slingshot Cops T-shirt around. Oh, nice. Oh, nice yeah. questions. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Well, uh, Dave, let's uh, do this again sometime. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and I hey. love listening to your show, so I'm a big fan. Excellent. Much appreciated. Thank you. Dave right, for for Dave, uh, Tom, and Charlie. This is Farley saying good night, everybody. <laughs>